So hello everyone and also hello Eric. I'm super happy to yeah uh, have you here for the Sean Club about Hyena DNA. Uh, a very hot paper discussed a lot also on open biomail and the Eleutheri. Um and yeah, and with that I will already hand it over to you. And yeah, I'm curious about your presentation. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Michael, for, for inviting. Uh, I'm very excited to give a talk on this. Um, this is a, a work of ours that um, an application that is new for us. We, we're traditionally a machine learning shop. Um, and so very curious to get people's feedbacks of where they might want to apply it to. Um, this is our first work, uh, as mentioned, in genomics. It's called Hyena DNA. And uh, a number of co-authors uh, were on this, on this paper. And so we're very thankful for their um, help as well. To, so so from background, uh, the research group I'm a part of uh, is at Stanford, uh, which is named Hazy Research. Um, myself, I'm a fourth year PhD student in bioengineering. Um, and we've been focusing on uh, one of the areas uh, to make better foundation models, or in other words, large language models. Uh, and they kind of come across two different uh, themes. One is to make them faster or, or longer. Um, some of these have looked like flash attention. For folks who might be familiar with that, it's the fastest implementation of the standard attention algorithm, which is about five to nine X faster than a standard implementation. Uh, the big part, the group I'm a part of, or subgroup I'm part of, works on uh, alternative architectures. So, you know, are there different types of neural network models beyond transformers uh, that we can look toward that might open up new capabilities? Uh, and these have looked like a couple of instantiations like S4, which is based on state space models, and Hyena, which is what we'll be diving into today uh, more in depth. And they're both, in particular, what makes them uh, more unique is that they're not, they don't rely on tension, but they rely on convolutions. So these are convolutional foundation models or large language models. One of the things that we observed when we started um, looking into um, this, this problem of long context, or essentially increasing the uh, memory ability or context ability of these language models, uh, we noticed a number of companies have set out goals focusing on typically natural language problems and code problems. But what we also observed was not as much attention to be, it was being paid by applying these long context foundation models to biology, which has some of the longest sequences um, out there, right? So for example, the human genome has about 3, bi 3 billion nucleotides, but the models that are being applied to these uh, tasks are typically in the range of two to 4,000 tokens or context lengths. And so we thought this space was relatively underexplored for these long context um, language models and that we might be able to apply some of the techniques we've been working on in our lab. We're also compelled really by the, the potential impact, right, for these models to be used in genomics or biology, in particular, and to be able to understand um, disease better or use them in drug discovery or target uh, discovery. Uh, but also things like personalized medicine could be really exciting. Uh, if you can imagine uh, enabling a, a model like ChatGT that could fit in context an entire human genome, you might be able to query that uh, query that genome for particular types of diseases or predict maybe drug reactions and ultimately guide treatment options for that person based on their specific genetic code, right? So this seems like very compelling potential future use cases that uh, make us really excited. Some background. So the space that we're, we're, we're targeting in this application is genomics, which is a study of all genetic material, including the structure, function, and evolution. Now, we looked at previous works um, in this space, applying genomics, uh, foundation models to genomics. And we noticed a couple of unique challenges um, in applying some of the, these techniques, you know, from natural language or even protein language models. Um, those, those key differences that kind of stood out to us was the context lengths are much larger in magnitude than previous uh, types of domains like language or proteins. Um, but the other thing that we, notice that was um, important perhaps is there also the resolution right so this is the smallest level in which you model your data uh, in, in language models they call these tokens and so you have to 
one of the design choices you have to make is what's the smallest resolution that you want to represent your data. So typically it could be like uh, word level, uh, it could be character level, but that seems challenging for these, some of these language models, uh, especially if you need also long context and high resolution. So these things like SNPs or a single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, a single character change or in DNA or character or nucleotide could alter genes, right? Traits or protein functions, or even cause a cell to enter disease state. Not, not entire genome does a single uh, SNP matter, but in certain parts of the genome, right? So it's really hard to necessarily know when a SNP will make a profound difference on a state. In terms of the methods that we looked at also in these previous um, genomic foundation models, um, that, you know, there's a lot of great work in this space like DNA BERT and the nucleotide transformer that have applied um, foundation models to genomics. And we, we largely followed their, their recipe in terms of you know, pre-training and applying to downstream tasks um, to, to learn how, how it's currently being done. But we also noticed a number of constraints, um, you know, as mentioned you know, before, again, these lengths that they've used typically were on the quote unquote shorter side of about 512 to 4,000 tokens which is just a tiny fraction of the human genome for, for a sense of scale. Um, and they've used tokenizers that typically aggregate a number of DNA characters into meaningful units like KMERS, uh, for example, or, or using these tokenizers called um, BPEs or byte pair encodings that can aggregate um, learned tokens uh, as well. Uh, and that these models were also potentially massive in scale. These are billion parameter models. Um, what, we, what we observed was, um, you know, the space we wanted to hopefully have tools that were accessible to not just the largest companies, right? Also researchers in academia uh, or elsewhere that um, could, could fit these models into memory. That, that was important to us. All right, so, so in general, you know, talked about some foundation models uh, broadly, but what, what are these general foundation models even trying to learn, right? These might be some uh, basic questions. Uh, and, and, and in general, they're trying to learn useful and general representations from DNA sequences implicitly. So very similar to how people train foundation models for language um, with the pre-trained task to learn these um, interactions in the data. We're, we're largely trying to do the same thing, um, but specifically DNA, let's, let's dive a little bit deeper to get a sense of what those interactions or things they might be learning. So we treat DNA uh, in this approach largely as a language with the assumption that there's an underlying grammar or syntax or, or some kind of pattern which we, we do know this, right? Because DNA does encode uh, genes. Uh, you can essentially create pr proteins from the information uh, in, our, in our genome. Um, but this, this portion of the genome of the coding regions is just about 2% or so about the, from our human genome. The majority of our genome uh, is non-coding regions, right? Regions that maybe not have informative information or, or that actually uh, regulate gene expression or in other words, regulate what's get, what gets built, right? So it's like for, for folks in computer science, uh, the genes might be you know, a class uh, and gene expression might be deciding on what gets instantiated, right? What objects to make. So this can lead to things like cell differentiation or, or different disease states by you know, not necessarily changing what's in the genetic code, but deciding on what to make in the first place, right? So it's a, it can be a fairly complex interaction between co coding and non-coding regions that we're treating essentially as a combinatorial problem of, uh, of these patterns and different motifs in your, in your DNA. So another example concretely, let's, let's take a look at the example where we have uh, a DNA sequence that might have a couple of gene regions, right? What needs to occur is uh, to, to create proteins is a protein complex named uh, RNA polymerase needs to bind to specific sites on your, on, your, uh, on your genome to kickstart the transcription process. And whether that protein binds, protein complex binds or not, uh, was in, is influenced by a number of DNA motifs, things that can promote, enhance, or, or repress um, this binding from occurring. Uh, and so this is how you can kind of have this interaction between what's in the regulatory regions and what's in your, uh, your, your coding regions. Um, and some of these interactions can be very long range. And so it can be difficult for models to incorporate all of these interactions. And this is one of the problems that we want to try to overcome with, with a more expressive long range foundation model. 
Now, previous, previous models uh, in a lot of domains beyond genomics um, use transformer architectures and, you know, rightfully so, because it's very powerful and expressive model applied to a number of domains as, as folks are probably familiar with um, vision, language, um, speech, and, and, and biology, right? But it does have its constraints as well. So as, as uh, high expressivity or high quality uh, as, as these models are, it comes at a cost. So in, in terms of computation, which folks in, in computer science measure by um, time complexity. And so um, you, you do have to spend a lot of compute essentially to train these things. I wanna contrast this with convolutions, with, uh, which is sort of has you know, somewhat an opposite kind of uh, property. The quality is not as, as high. Um, it does have a, typically the classical convolution has a, has a local receptive field. So the range in which it aggregates information of your input is, is shortened. It's a local, uh, local operation, but the time complexity is fast, right? It's typically a linear operation if your kernel or your filter size K is, is short. So it's a very fast operation. And so uh, they both have their trade-offs. And in this work, and particularly for Hyena, uh, the model itself, um, you know, we asked, is there a way to combine these two and get the best of, of both worlds, right? That's kind of a key question for the original Hyena uh, operation, which we're, we're certainly dive to. Now, to, to design uh, Hyena, the, the, the operator, uh, we, we sort of took an approach where we tried to distill key properties of attention so the you know the fund fundamental operation and transformer is the attention mechanism um, to to distill these two properties and see if we can leverage them. So one of those properties is um, global attention. So what you see here, oh, sorry, global context. What you see here is uh, a number of tokens, and the idea here is that for each token, it can essentially compare itself with every other token in a sequence, right? So it has this pairwise uh, ability to to compare, it, and it's kind of like a brute force way to um, measure interactions between your data your data points very powerful but you can see this is why this the computation can become very expensive so it scales uh, in the n squared operation in terms of time complexity and, and so if your sequence doubles right then your your computation quadruples right so you have the squaring law that grows very quickly this other property that we're distilling that is less um, perhaps observed or talked about, is what we're calling data dependent operation. Uh, we have a attention um, equation here, but I'm going to focus on more of like the intuition about what we mean by data dependent operation. So you have in attention uh, the use of these three projections called the query, key, and value. And essentially, what the operation is doing is is somehow mixing the information between these projections uh, to find interactions that are dependent on the data itself. So the operation changes depending on the, the input itself. So maybe that might sound kind of abstract. Let's provide a specific example of, of where this might occur in a language analogy. So we have an example here for uh, translation from a German sentence represented by these uh, blue tokens here to English, right? And so a transformer will decode or translate one word at a time and what it's what's what's essentially happening is this as you're trying to learn a representation for each word uh, in this autoregressive way, it's essentially trying to learn a distribution of how to reweight the embeddings of each German word, right? So initially, this distribution only is affected by one English uh, token, like the start token. But as you decode and translate more English words, this is fed back into the operation. And now your weighting or your distribution of the German tokens is changing. And so it's dependent on the context being what you've decoded so far. And that's what we mean by context dependent um, operation. And we one of the key reasons why we think transformer is so powerful. In contrast to standard convolutions, your filter that you, you know, this is an example of let's say you stride a filter over an image, right? From like left to right, top, top down. The filter that you're applying for every position on the input. The filter itself is the same. It's not context specific. So that's a key differentiation in these two operations um, that we'll try to overcome. So given armed with these two design properties of attention that we that are desirable, 
um, that make them very expressive. Let's design a hyena operator from, from scratch or from a starting point, which is uh, a, a transformer block here. Uh, so we, we start with a transformer block. Um, it's a basic building block of a transformer where you just stack these layers, right? You stack these blocks uh, consecutively. Um, it's made up of an attention layer and MLP layer. Those are the two main components. Now for hyena, what we do is we swap out the attention layer and also remove the positional biddings um, for a hyena operator. And if you to if you were to walk away and take, you know, a main thing about what the heck the hyena operator is, it is made up of two key components that try to mimic those two properties I described before that um, attention has. And that's the global context and the data dependency. Um, so we use, instead of attention, we use what we call a long convolution that has global context, right? So typically convolutions are short range. We've made a long convolution, a long kernel essentially. Uh, and then we use this, what we're calling a data, an element wise gate. Um, I'm gonna show you what these mean, um, but that is essentially used to mimic the data dependency operation. So zooming into the hyena operator here, we're gonna walk through each of the the steps um, and how what you know how the data passes through the hyena. So the first step is very similar to attention in that you project your input into three different um, representations. Uh, we use the same notation in this example, um, but we use them very differently than attention. So we have the query, the key, and the value, similar the same as attention. The difference here is that instead of just using a dense layer or or a standard linear layer in, in PyTorch. Um, we also apply a short convolution to that projection as well. So that is a key distinction. The next, the next step is um, simply taking two of those projections and doing an element-wise uh, multiplication. We call that a gate. So th those two representations are the same shape. So it's literally just multiplying each other. The more uh, guts of the model is in this long convolution operation, which we'll, we'll dive into next. But um, you have the long convolution that applies a, a long uh, kernel over the input. And then you take one more uh, gate with that output of the long convolution. And, and that's for, for the large part, the, the, the meat of the operation. Oops. Now you could repeat this a number of times that we define in the, in the original hyena work as a recurrence to make the model deeper if you wish, but that's, that's sort of optional. What's more important is the long convolution, right? Let's let's dive into those details there. There's a, there's a few different complexities that it's worth describing to hopefully give folks um, some more intuition about our, our design choices there. So uh, one of the first things about this long convolution to, to know is that it's an implicit convolution, right? Very different from your standard convolution, which we call which we're calling explicit convolution. Um, and so this this main benefit is that it's more parameter efficient. So let's take an example. If you have an explicit convolution and your input is, let's say, 1 million tokens long, the number of parameters in your filter that you need to use and to need to learn is also 1 million, right? So the, the larger the input, the more parameters you need. And so this is where uh, traditionally these models start to fail or have a hard time uh, learning from because uh, they need so many parameters and it becomes an intractable type of task. In implicit convolutions, uh, for the same input, you define a separate function that will learn to output the weights of your kernel. So that, that's a mouthful, uh, but essentially you get less, you use less parameters on a fixed budget to handle an arbitrarily long kernel that you want for your convolution. So this separate function that we use is actually a separate mini neural network, right? So it's just a few different dense layers with activation functions um, and a smoothing operation, but really just a, an MLP at the end of the day, a simple uh, few layers stacked on each, on each other. Uh, to, to, to describe this concept of implicit functions a little bit more, um, I have an example here or analogy of a simple line on a, uh, on a plane, right? Let's say you want to define uh, a very long line, right? One way to do it is to explicitly provide the coordinates for every single point along that line, right? To define that line. Another efficient way to do that is just to learn a few parameters, right? The slope and the intercept. And now you're able to define every point on that line, right? So in this analogy, the long line is the kernel we want and the parameters that we need to learn 
is the neural, the mini neural network. So hopefully that analogy uh, makes sense to folks. And then concretely, what we're doing it, you know, what we're doing in terms of actually, um, you know, passing data through is we're passing in the positions of the kernel that we want, right? So not the input itself, but the positions. So these are the index positions passing through the NLP and outputs, it outputs the weights of the kernel that you want to apply for a convolution. It's not the output yet, it's just the, the weights of the kernel. Okay, so I've been on this, this uh, long convolution for some time, but it's very worth um, diving into. Another key thing about this um, global convolution for kernels is that if your kernel is the size of your input, it becomes a quadratic operation again, right? So it, it's no longer linear because the kernel is so long. And so, um, you know, now you're back to square one, right? So we take, we take advantage of a key uh, convolutional theorem uh, in, for, you know, that's very popular in signal processing, which states that um, a space convolution or a convolution done in the normal time domain, space domain that you can think that you normally do it in is equivalent to uh, um, an element-wise multiplication in the Fourier or frequency domain. So lots to unpack there, but essentially uh, this theorem allows us to speed up the convolution. And so it, this makes sense when your convolutional kernel is very long. It doesn't make sense for short kernels because um, there's just like crossing point in terms of uh, how many operations that takes. And so your, if your kernel is very long, it, it starts to become a time complexity um, in the Fourier domain, it makes much more sense to go through that space. And you get a speed up that reduces the complexity from n squared to n log n, which is essentially near uh, linear or log linear um, that we take advantage of. So another piece of complexity that we, you know, we take advantage of in this model. Um, okay, so now we have, the, we have uh, a hyena model that, you un that we unpacked to talk about its components. We have a sense of uh, genomic uh, tasks um, that we're trying to learn in terms of uh, underlying representations and inter interactions. Let's look at the actual experiments that we've tried to show um, how this model could be used in genomics. So the first step in training a foundation model is the pre-training task, right? It's a self-supervised learning task um, to implicitly learn the interactions or, or the distribution of your data, right? So in our setup, we use a single human reference genome uh, which is um, in contrast to some other works that might use a lot more data. Um, but we wanted to kind of push the limits on how much you can learn from one particular human genome and, and really focus on other things, right, that we'll talk about. So starting for the human genome, we sample a given sequence uh, of a specified length from the human genome. Um, and then the task, you know, the simple task is to predict the next nucleotide, a single character level, uh, in that sequence. And we do that autoregressively, right? Uh, but we do that multiple iterations trained over across the data in many epochs. And so the idea is that through this, 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 this task, right, that your model is gonna learn implicitly and, and, and within its weights, um, key patterns and underlying statistics in the data itself, right? All the interactions, both in coding and non-coding regions. And then we can take those learned representations and apply them to downstream tasks that we actually care about. Right, so these are examples that some folks uh, in genomics in the field might uh, be interested in and have applied um, deep learning models to. Uh, these include regulatory element classification. So these are like classification level or function predicting functions given a sequence. Um, chromatin profile prediction, species classification. Um, these are standard fine tuning tasks that we apply um, the hyena DNA model to, uh, but we also, started looking into exploring um, in-context learning, which uh, if we have time, we'll talk about, which is um, uh, something that we um, think is, has made foundation models very popular and very very expressive and strong in, in terms of uh, their use as a natural language, right? Um, that we wanted to see if we can bring that over to genomics. Um, okay, so for pre-training the um, hyena DNA models, we, we focused on a few different dimensions of varying the models th themselves to see how they might behave, right? What's the training dynamics like? like? And so we, we varied the number of layers, uh, the width, so like the embedding dimension, uh, but as well as the sequence length, right? The context length of the inputs. 
So what, one of the first takeaways or things that we wanted to showcase um, in this work was um, what happens when you vary sequence length on your pre-training task. And so one way to measure that is with uh, perplexity in the PPL here. And that's just really a measure of um, how well your model is able to predict the next token in a sequence. So still at the you know, simple super self-supervised task. Um, and what we're show, able to show is that as you increase the context length, you're able to better predict what's the next token, right? That's, that's basically telling, them, telling us that the model is able to incorporate that context and use that to predict um, what's in the next, uh, what's, what's the next part of the sequence. Presumably it has a better understanding of the data to be able to do that. that that's what we're um, interpreting this as. Um, notably, we were able to train up to a million tokens for this model and uh, which represents about a 500 times increase over previous genomic foundation models during pre-training. And so we hopefully, hopefully we, we think this is um, uh, a step forward that allows folks to have, have applied to new tasks that they weren't able to before. Um, we, we compared it with the transformer model uh, as well uh, up in the up top left there. Um, and there's a few other things that we can pick apart in terms of this chart. It's a very data rich, um, uh, figure. Uh, a couple of things to point out that we noticed during pre-training is that you, you don't necessarily get better performance for free, quote unquote. You do have to train longer. Um, so for example, it is more token hungry as you increase the context length to, to, for it to be able to reach a certain level of quality. Um, so there are some trade-offs there. Um, and there's also a saturation point. So for example, if you increase the length too much for the given model size, um, the performance will start going down, right? So there, there is this kind of U-shaped curve if your model size is not large enough. So that's a, a key takeaway. Uh, we also ex ex uh, experience uh, instability in the training as well, which is something that we've uh, noticed other folks who explored uh, long context in other domains like language ha have also experienced. Um, and so it's just difficult for deep learning models in general to incorporate such long context uh, in modeling their interactions that it, sometimes when they're, the error is too high that you get these jumps and loss basically. Uh, and it's sometimes can be difficult for them to recover, quote unquote. Um, and so we've come up with some different uh, strategies to overcome that. Uh, sometimes it involves learning rate manipulation, like right? essentially decreasing it so that it's less uh, uh, so that so it's less not as unstable, um, but we also developed this this method called the sequence length up sequence length warm up scheduler, and the idea is to essentially uh, gradually warm up your sequence length, and you can think of this as like slowly increasing the difficulty to your model, right? So to to gradually um, uh, uh, increase the complexity, and what you oh did we get a question? No, okay, we're good. Um, what you're able to do is actually, um, yes, I, yeah, I'm happy to happy to take a clarification question if there's any. Yeah, does the unmute work? Dylan raised his hand, and you should be able to unmute, are you? Does it work for you, Dylan? Perhaps not. Um, if I so, also I'll, I will stick around afterwards too. So if folks have more questions, I'm very happy to provide some more questions. But yeah, go ahead, Dylan. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry, I felt like I was like in a in a box and I couldn't couldn't uh, say anything because the, the the mute button didn't work. Um, or the unmute un button. Okay, so the question I have is, um, so you uh, varied the length of the context uh, over over the training duration. I'm curious, like, is that even allowed from like a perspective of like, um, like a batch perspective? Because when I have been training models, I've been thinking about like batch length and are you basically, are you like modifying the, the, um, the tensor that the, the data it, that the model is being trained on kind of uh, over, over the training duration? Is that what's going on? Yes. Yeah, it's it's not too complex. Um, you, it's just a matter of playing around with PyTorch and 
designing your data loader so that you can gradually in stages increase the context length. It just basically just reloads the data loader uh, and, and, and sets the, the max length to a different length. Cool. Um, and you can, do, um, you can do that on a schedule. Nice. So, yeah. so it, it improved uh, the, um, the loss, I guess? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Very, very cool. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. For sure. So, so yeah, a, cu a couple of key takeaways from this schedule that we observed. Um, it, it also it decreases training time. So we use it on the, uh, one of the downstream tasks, in particular for species classification. Um, we're able to reduce the training time by about 40% because you train on smaller sequences, you know, initially, which are faster to train. Um, and then it also leads to better performance. And so you have this chart here on the right where uh, the blue is the, with the warm-up scheduler and it, it did boost ultimate performance. So it's essentially just providing some more stability um, and, and better training dynamics for your model to learn. Okay, so for actual downstream tasks, right? Let's look at some numbers. Um, so we have the first set of uh, data sets on the genomic benchmarks, which is a, a fairly new data set uh, of about eight tasks where you're trying to predict for a given sequence, its regulatory element, uh, regulatory function, or also some, um, some, of this, some small level species classification tasks as well. Uh, and in this case, what we're showing here is, you know, against the baseline and our, and our own internal baseline for a transformer that we trained as well. Uh, in all cases, we're able to, you know, bump performance by a fairly good margin um, uh, by using standard fine tuning. Now, a, a more difficult set of benchmarks from a recent paper this year on the nucleotide transformer, which is, which is a really great piece of uh, a research that we've uh, looked, looked at quite a bit. Uh, and, we, and we kind of use that as our standard to apply our, our model for at least the, what we're calling short range tasks. Uh, also sequence level uh, classification on uh, regulatory elements like enhancers and promoters uh, and, and histone marks or, or and splice sites. Um, so same task, you know, trying to classify if it has that function or not. Um, so what we're showing here is that um, with with our model, uh, with the hyena DNA model, we're able to be very fairly competitive with um, with a nucleotide transformer on a number of uh, data sets. Um, yeah, actually, go, go, we, I think we have a question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Eric, uh, I have a question for like for the comparison of the let's say the Hyana and the transformer in the case of let's say uh, like enhancer. So I was expecting since you are taking longer uh, context, the difference should be I mean really high there, right? Comparing your model with transformers, comparing to the to the let's say to the situation in which you need the local DNA sequences only, for example, I don't know like. Uh, some yeah. promoter or something like this, but I don't see that differences. I mean, great, that great should question. Be the, yeah. So why it's the case? Yeah. So so okay. I'm very glad you asked that. Um, I kind of glossing over the details here, but this is worth mentioning that these two benchmarks, the the previous one, the genomic benchmarks, and the nucleotide transformer, all the sequence lengths are are fairly short. They're on the order of 200 to le less than a thousand or so, typically. So at this point, we are not necessarily measuring or comparing the increase in context length. What we're probably focusing on more so is what the difference is for single nucleotide resolution. So in this case, the nucleotide transformer uses KMERS. So they, they use K equals six. And so they're aggregating into larger DNA words, quote unquote. Uh, and so we, uh, by kind of DNA and transformer, the one that we trained here, are both single nucleotide resolution. So what you're seeing here is a sort of a, a mini ablation or comparing um, two things. What's the difference in or benefit of, of modeling at single nucleotide resolution? And what's the benefit of modeling attention versus transformer? Or, sorry, attention versus hyena, which is the, the convolution. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you. OK, awesome, awesome. Great question. Um, sort of one of the, the main highlights I wanted to um, point out here was um, the model size difference also. So nucleotide transformer, you know, a great breakthrough in terms of uh, foundation models and size, um, but also uh, the high DNA model in this case is about 1500 times smaller um, using way less data as well. So our model is about a million and a half parameters compared to two and a half billion, which, um, it, you know, can be hard to fit into memory, but a high DNA model in this case 
um, you can fit on a single GPU and probably train in CoLab actually, um, and still perform very, very, very well competitively, right? Um, so some folks have also asked, um, you know, what, where does this performance gain come from? Uh, and so we did some further relations during um, the review process. This, this paper is in review for, for NERPS. Um, so what you see here is a standard uh, column here is just the standard high in a DNA model. That's what, that's what we mean by standard. Uh, and then we're swapping out key components one at a time. So a KMER, instead of the single nucleotide resolution, we're using a KMER. Uh, tokenizer at that point, and already there you see a, a fairly substantial difference from using a KMER versus a single nucleotide resolution. So certainly, uh, you see a gain from this this you know using a tokenizer at this resolution, this higher resolution. Um, we also get questions about um, the causal or autoregressive nature of the high in the DNA model, and you know why not use a bidirectional version for for folks who are familiar with that, like a BERT style model. Uh, we did do a quick ablation on this task where we did have a, a, a bi-directional implementation um, for, for Hyena and where we trained it from scratch. So we're not, this is not, using, not using the mass language modeling yet, but just from scratch uh, with the standard causal from scratch as well. Um, you actually get not, not really a performance gain from a bi-directional model in this case. And so, um, you know, this is one instantiation uh, of, of the bi-directional Implementation, there's other ways to do it. You might see gains if you do another way, but it, it's worth mentioning that um, it's been explored. Um, okay, so we talked about um, some 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 quality metrics or like accuracy and, and, and F1 scores. Um, we also compared on runtime. So this is comparing with a, a transform model of the same size, right? Now we're just comparing runtime differences as you compare the sequence length. That's what we want to tease out uh, in terms of differences. And what you're seeing here on the chart is uh, a log scale, both on the time runtime for a forward pass and a backward pass through your model. And, uh, on the X axis, the sequence length. Um, so these are both log scales so that the curves don't look as dramatic, but, but if you did them in non log scale, it would look even more, much more contrast, but already here, you can see at 1 million, uh, sequence length, uh, it's about 106 times faster than a transformer where we can play with flash attention in particular, right? A fast optimized version of attention. So that's, that's notable. Um, for shorter sequences, you know, there is some slowdown, right? So it's, there's a crossover point around 8,000 tokens or so where um, Hyena DNA is actually a little slower. Um, that's potentially more of like an implementation or, or like a hardware kind of um, constraint that is not optimized for the, the fast Fourier transform that where we do the convolutions. But that is also being worked on that um, will eventually speed that up too. So we'll definitely see more comparable results in the future uh, for short ranges. Um, hey, Eric, uh, I was just going to jump in with the, a question. Um, sure. It was actually related to the previous slide. Um, yeah, really cool to see that new result. I, I don't think that's in the um, archive preprint yet. Um, but yeah, I think that's this right. has been probably a common question that you've gotten. Uh, but, you know, to kind of tie back to the, your introduction uh, with the observation and conceptualization of the data dependence of the attention mechanism, right? Um, and you kind of frame it in this way that as you're doing this autoregressive decoding, you know, the weights of the um, uh, distribution change across different tokens, right? So I'm curious how you square that with this observation. Um, you know, it kind of comes to my question of, do you think this auto regressive decoding is an essential component of the learning dynamics of the attention mechanism? Um, uh, it, like, is this a critical component of how the model learns based on the previous context or is like a bi-directional um, approach, you know, just as likely to work uh, or, or do you have more intuition around that? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think there's anything fundamentally from attention perspective that relies like on causal or our regressive so much that makes like that the, the way to go. I think it's a little bit unknown, maybe not unknown, but um, not well um, studied exactly where bidirectional versus causal works exactly better. There people have hunches and there's like anecdotes and like, uh, uh, yeah, people's intuitions. But I think it depends on the use case 
that you want to apply it to, what your, your actual end goal, your data set, probably, you know, how much data. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think uh, it certainly depends on the task. Uh, but the causal part, uh, I don't think for genomics is something that is a must to be to perform the best is the main takeaway. I think it, you could implement bidirectional most likely with um, other variations, you know, the one beyond the one we hit here, there's multiple ways to do it um, that could actually perform better or, or, or as well that we um, that we're also exploring. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Yeah, I think good question. OK, so so uh, along the line of efficiency, um, there's, a, there's a number of ways or dimensions to look at it. So we previously we looked at, you know, apples to apples for the same model. But the other thing we want to compare is, um, you know, to get the same level of quality, uh, how much data did you throw at the problem, right? So for comparing a couple of uh, past foundation models to reach the same level of quality, um, use vastly different resources. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you know, we wanted to point that out in terms of GPU hours. Um, we thought that was very interesting um, and, and hopefully um, gives people another data point of, uh, on a level of uh, efficiency. Uh, in terms of another downstream task that we started to, to look at for um, longer context, right? So now we're starting to focus on the longer context tasks. One um, somewhat simple conceptually version where we, we applied it, uh, 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 the high end model to is on species classification, what we're calling like a long range version. Um, and the, the task is, uh, you know, simple. You, you just sample a, a sequence from a number of different species and you try to predict where that species, what, what the label of that species is with the idea that, um, you know, DNA can be shared across a number of species. And so if you have short context, then it's not able to distinguish between them as well as, as much as a longer context window. And so what we wanted to tease out here is that what's the gain in performance you might get uh, by increasing context length, right? So we go from 1K to a million, uh, and in this, it's this, this example here, we use five different species. Um, the main takeaway is not necessarily the absolute performance. The main takeaway is that this is just the test bed uh, for you to design how difficult you want the task to be, right? Because you can actually engineer this as, more, as difficult as you want. For example, if you chose very different species, the task becomes easier because it's easier to, you know, the, the difference in sequences are, are very high. But if you chose animals or, or species that are very similar, like a bunch of primates, the task is actually very hard, right? So you, we kind of find this sweet spot because what we're interested here is um, teasing out the gain in performance for across sequence length or the differences. Um, yeah, so we wanted to point that out. Uh, compare that to with transformers, which um, have a limited ability to, to increase context length. Uh, it just becomes intractable for them. Uh, and so uh, interesting comparison there. Uh, we did apply it to this uh, chromatin profile task, which is um, a competitive uh, and challenging benchmark um, that is trying to predict a, a multitask problem. So it predicts 919 way binary task for a given sequence. So 900, 900, 919 different um, uh, tasks simultaneously. Uh, we compare with a couple of previous models um, that were state of the art in this space. One, one being the big bird model, which is, um, also an attention model, but is a special kind, which is known as a sparse uh, attention model. So it's not a full, full dense attention. It essentially skips some tokens in between so that it can handle a longer context is its main um, innovation there. And so we compare with that model and we're able to show that it's uh, hyenas competitive with these previous models. So in certain lengths, it surpasses in other lengths, it's, it's, um, about competitive, so uh, a little bit um, about the same, right? But the main takeaway here is uh, the size of the model difference, the size of the models. Um, they're, the, the hyena models are, again, much, much smaller than the previous models. I, I see some questions, but uh, if it's OK, I'll, I'll save some of these the questions toward the end. I'll, I'll stick around um, for just to make sure that we can cover um, most of the material, if that's OK with folks. But I'm, I'm very appreciative that folks are asking questions. Uh, but hold those thoughts. Um, so uh, another area um, is this, do we want to talk about, yeah, we'll talk about this qu quickly because it might take a little bit longer, but uh, I'll just share a little bit about the work that we just, we applied um, Hyena to for in-context learning. And in-context learning is essentially a way to adapt to new tasks 
without having to fine tune or, or, or pre-train or, or retrain the model. And so this, you can imagine this being really appealing, right? Where you can just, for example, show examples of the task in the prompt itself. Or like, if you can imagine ChatGPT, you're interacting with it and you're telling the model, um, this is an example of a positive, uh, let's say positive movie review. This is an example of a negative movie review. Now, given this new movie review, tell me what you think the, uh, what the label should be. Is it a positive or negative? Um, and it, it just is able to adapt given the new context that you've given it to this new task. Um, and so we, we thought this was a very desirable thing. Um, and we wanted to apply this to, to Hyena uh, DNA. Now, the main takeaway is that out of the box, this, this setup does not work for us. Um, and, uh, you know, there's probably a number of reasons for that. Uh, in terms of like size of the model, you know, it is a very small size model. Uh, but also there's this concept of your data where there's not, not really, you know, during the pre-training, there's not really this concept of classes. You're, you're just seeing next nucleotides. Um, you know, this is very, very in contrast to how large model, language models are trained. They have the entire internet basically. Um, and it can learn all the different ideas of that description and classes. That's one key distinction. Um, and so instead we, we do like a, a variation of in-context learning, um, which we're uh, adapting from work from Google on soft tunable tokens. And the idea here is that you freeze the DNA model, the high-end DNA model that you've pre-trained. Instead, you add learnable tokens in the sequence length itself. And the idea is that these learnable tokens will guide the output of the model to essentially behave or predict what you want to predict, right? So it's another way to adapt uh, to new tasks without having to do the standard fine tuning. This, this is still fine tuning, but um, you're not touching the model, you're touching the learnable tokens in the sequence. And then what you're able to do is fill up your model, or sorry, fill up your sequence, your, your, your context with even more tokens that are learnable. And what we show is that as you increase these number of learnable tokens, the performance does go up. And so it's, you know, it's seeing the trajectory that we, that we, uh, that we want. Uh, and so we think it's a promising space for folks who want that ability for, um, you know, simpler ways to adapt to newer tasks. Um, we also visualize the embeddings and, and for, for time, I'll kind of gloss over this, but we essentially, we, we try to measure the separation of the learned features in the pre-training tasks. So these are frozen embeddings from the fr frozen model embeddings. Uh, and then we measure how well they classify different classes of what we call biotypes or like transcripts or genes. Um, and we show that, you know, we're better, better able to separate than previous foundation models in, in this space. Okay, so I, I did want to touch upon future work because this is um, something that, you know, we're, we're constantly thinking about. And, and really, this is why we're trying to uh, share the work, right? We want folks to um, explore where this, this model could be used uh, in other spaces. We, we think it'll likely work well uh, in a number of discriminative tasks, right? So um, you know, folks have, have mentioned informer to do gene expression prediction, uh, splice detection, histone uh, modification. We, we think it'll work well there. Um, we're also very excited about the generative side. Um, you know, this, this has been less done in genomics, but, you know, we want to talk about or give a flavor of some of the, the things that we're excited about there. And so if folks who, who are also excited about this want to chat, please feel free to reach out. Um, but yeah, so, so one of the tasks that we've, uh, were inspired by or uh, have seen from folks uh, in the DNA diffusion project within the um, open bio ML community. Uh, so these are examples from their, their site that we think would be you know, really neat uh, applications as well. But if you can prompt on a description uh, of a type of sequence that you want, so you know, a sequence that will activate a gene to its maximum special level in cell type X, there, you know, then generate the sequence autoregressively. Right, that would be very compelling, very hard task, I imagine, but um, very, very, um, very, very, very useful. Um, other things that we we were interested in also um, is a multimodal approach or or a different modality. What if you had um, the reverse of the informer, for example? So prompt or condition on a gene expression profile and generate the sequence uh, for that gene expression. So another another way to flip that around. We're also really excited about um, this idea of DNA miniaturization. So let's say you have 
uh, a given sequence with a desired function that's uh, in the megabase or, or you know millions of nucleotides long, including coding and non-coding regions, but it has some kind of desired feature that you want. Uh, and then the task would be to miniaturize or distill that to a smaller sequence in the thousands of sequence length level. Um, you know, why would you why would you want to do this? Um, you can imagine this could be useful for gene therapy, right? Um, gene therapy has typically like limited range in terms of cargo that you can or the length that you can inject, for example. Um, and so it could be desirable to essentially summarize, you know, what's in that DNA to a smaller package. Uh, and to be able to use that for gene therapy. Um, and, and from a machine learning standpoint, this could be, you know, this is fairly straightforward. It's a sequence to sequence task where you're essentially doing like um, a summarization, right? Like a large amount of text, summarize into a smaller uh, paragraph, for example. Um, the challenge is, is all in the, how do you get this data set? Is, does that data set exist? <laughs> um, and so th that's something that we, we think would be very really compelling. Um, if folks are familiar with, you know, where data sources like this might exist, or if you're working on this, we'd love to chat. Yeah, and with that, um, that covers uh, all the things we wanted to cover. Uh, and to summarize really quickly, uh, we presented a genomic foundation model called Hyena DNA, which is built on the Hyena operator, a convolutional language model. Um, and we focus on and apply it to long range and high resolution genomics. Um, with a number of properties like efficiency and size and speed uh, and, and perform quite competitively on a number of downstream tasks. Uh, and we're really excited about um, showcasing this for um, or using this for uh, tasks that actual computational biologists, uh, who, who, you know, problems that they care about um, and hopefully are, are, are impactful in, in the space. Um, and we're happy to take questions, um, all, all, our, all our code is available publicly or all our weights. Uh, we do have a Discord channel to um, you know, encourage brainstorming if you have uh, questions about the model and the code. Uh, and then our emails is here as well. Uh, we have a link to the blog and the blog has all the, the links for, for this information as well. Um, and so yeah, thanks thanks so much guys for, for listening. Um, really appreciate it and, and excited to hear folks' feedback. Sorry, can I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I have a question about this uh, tokenization step. So, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm biologist. Let's say looking at the gene expression, for me, the, the, the smallest token in gene expression would be codons, or let's say this three nucleotides. Or if you go a bit bigger, it would be, let's say, each individual exons or, I don't know, introns, like, like all the annotation, let's say, we have in the, in the gene through the work of all the biologists. So I was wondering, so you included only the single nucleotide basically as a single token. I was wondering, like, is there any way that you can implement that uh, inside your tokenization basically to complement this single nucleotide as a, as a token and to help basically the model to understand the tokens that they are real? I hope you understand yeah, I my question. Yeah, yeah. So it's a matter of uh, increasing your vocabulary size. So if you if you have sorry, I cannot so hear you. you Maybe uh, a different vocabulary that you want. To... Um, can anybody else hear me, or is it just? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can repeat it. So that was my problem. Most probably my internet problem. It would be great to repeat it. Yeah, sure. So yeah, your question about um, can you add more tokens or different types of representations? The, so the answer is it's all a matter of. Um, changing your tokenizer, and it sounds like all you want to do is to add different um, vocabulary uh, tokens for those codons. So if you have like 20 something so codons, you just add it to the vocabulary and your tokenizer will essentially encode the sequence with that vocabulary. Yeah, for that, that's that's right. But how how would you do that for let's say for the for the more like uh, manual manually annotated let's say tokens? For example, like I don't know, exons like lengths of exons. So you cannot put any rules on them. So for codons, you can say this twenty codons as my token. But for manually annotated uh, part of the part of the geno genome, I mean like yeah. Like technically, so, so, how, how can you do that? 
Yeah, so so this is a more of a question for uh, you know how does how does natural language um, how do they how do they handle tokenization for uh, large vocabularies or like more complex mm -hmm. vocabularies? So there's, there's they, so we're not innovating here on ourselves, but there's um, works on tokenizers in the language community that I would recommend looking at. But byte pair encodings or BPE is the one you want to look at, and so those things will. Um, using essentially the frequency of how often those patterns occur in your in your data will decide on the rules in which uh, a certain token will represent a certain number of characters. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so we got a question from, I, 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 yeah, I'll just kind of go off the top, I guess. Uh, we got a question from James. Go ahead. Hi there. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. This is an incredible model. Uh, Thank I you. Actually, I have so many questions, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try. Yeah, to... Awesome. Um, I had a question about the size of the input. I, I know it sounds like um, three gigabases, the entire human genome is a long way away, but given how much of an improvement this model is, um, it feels like it's not so far away <laughs> in, in reality. <laughs> when we hit models that have such a big input range, sort of getting to the entire genome size, uh, what do you think will be the next sort of big breakthrough? It would it be you mentioned, for example, multimodal data, so bringing in more data types, or is there some other direction you see this sort of field going? Oh, such a good question. So I, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. Um, I, I kind of feel I suspect computational biologists might have a better use case. I I, just, I can only speculate is my my, <laughs> and I, that's what I did on my on like at the beginning was like where I think you know long context could be used, but um, yeah, so so. One way, one place I speculate uh, it could be useful, um, the UK Biobank, right? So there's lots of functional annotations with, uh, with you know, exomes of, of, of folks, and you could potentially map those entire genomes or part, parts of genomes to very abstract, very high level uh, functional annotations. Um, that could be really interesting, right? If you can map such a long dimensional, like high dimensional data, to something like uh, disease or health outcomes um, more accurately than what's done in the past, which I think believe they just use SNP level uh, typically uh, or single nucleotides at certain positions. Um, if we can increase the in context of entire uh, exomes or genomes, that could be really exciting um, as well. But I'm sure there's a number of different areas that um, we, we are happy and hopefully we'll hear more about from folks um, as well. So very good question. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and feel free to follow up with, uh, you know, reach out to us offline too if if you have more questions. Um, we're happy to to address any. Thank um, you, William, I, go I ahead. definitely will. Okay, awesome, awesome. Go ahead, William. Oh, th thanks. Yeah, thanks again. I, yeah, I have a lot of questions also, but it's really really exciting to see this work being applied in the computational biology domain. As we see, there's actually a lot of applications here. Um, so cool to see awesome. your group kind of uh, put some resources in here. It's really, really awesome. Um, so yeah, kind of, you know, uh, my question is in, in line actually with some of these applications and how you may be thinking about um, iterating on this, especially, you know, given this result that you're able to increase the performance on a lot of these downstream tasks um, while reducing not only the model size, but the data set size, right, that you're pre-training on, right? Like that's that's really interesting to me. Um, but, you know, with with DNA, right, what we know and why we use these SNPs um, is that there's a huge amount of repeated elements right across the genome, right? So some of these like causal SNPs are, you know, one or two places that are different um, that are causing disease. So I'm curious if you put any thought into how you're thinking about that with respect to modeling, right? Um, where we have oftentimes maybe large bands of repeat information uh, but we also have these valuable annotations out there, right, that have to do with statistics we've computed about the causality or or the correlation between SNPs and disease. Uh, is it like an area that you guys are investigating at all? That's a good question. So uh, the short answer is at right now, not really. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more we could add to the pre-training task probably um, to to make it have more, have better inductive bias, right? Right. Right now, we're, we're taking a very similar approach to large language right, models, right? right? Other natural language approaches. We just digest a ton of information and you let the model sort out with all those complexities of when to pay yeah. attention, when not to pay attention, 
um, we have not instilled in, in any of our own expertise or others' expertise, um, you know, for better or worse. Um, but very, very, very worthwhile yeah. thing to do, I imagine. Absolutely. Right. Because there is so much genomic data out there and there's only going to be more. But, um, you know, there's a probably an efficient way to integrate it as well. But anyways, um, just spurring like a lot of interesting thoughts down the road here. So thanks so much for the time. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for the question. And a quick, 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 uh, maybe brainstorming off that. I imagine you could incorporate some of those things or re-inject re those back into the model somehow, right? Whether it's a prompt, whether it's right. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Certain, sure. Certain certain positional embeddings that you incorporate with that token to tell it to really pay attention. Um, sure. The, like the weighted limit. by the coefficients. Yeah. Sure. Yes, yeah, sky's the limit. I, I imagine, um, but, which makes it an awesome, fascinating space, right? There's so much to be done and to potentially innovate on. Thanks. Um, all right. So I, I, I can only see one person asking questions at a time. So I'll just take from the top. Uh, James, go ahead. It's OK. So I'll just ask one more. Um, you, yeah, talked yeah. About, you talked about efficiency and um, the fact that this is 1,500 times smaller than one of its competitor, competitor I guess, co-models. Uh, do you think you've built up an intuition to answer how much smaller do you think these models could get with the right architectures? And what sort of way do you see that going in the future? Yeah, so uh, well, yeah, it's interesting. We haven't thought about making the model smaller. We've actually thought about making it bigger. Um, so the so other thing that I wanted to point out was um, that I didn't emphasize here. Uh, you know, we trained a number of different model sizes. Uh, and each model was selected for like, given the data set. So if the data set is small, or if we, you know, the sequence lengths are small, we chose smaller models to fine tune on. So there, there's not like a one size fits all in, in this particular work. So we, we didn't really explore um, the trade-offs in model sizes necessarily like, you know, but what, what we did notice is if you make a model too big, if we chose a model that was too big, you know, for hyena, um, it actually performed worse on these downstream tasks. And um, what we suspect what's happening yeah, we suspect what's happening is that um, a lot of these genomic, genomic benchmark data sets are very small. And so overfitting becomes a very uh, big issue. So um, that's something to keep in mind here as well. So uh, it, yeah, it depends a lot on your data sets and your tasks, I would say, uh, on how to select the right model size. Um, which I found a similar thing with my significantly simpler models when i use, when i use too much genome context the model starts significantly not even overfitting there's just too much complexity for it to capture when there's too much context so i i wondered if you can counter the similar things so you've accidentally asked one of my other questions as well thank you I oh appreciate awesome that. yeah yeah for sure yeah yeah there's definitely an interesting dynamic going on when people think about like right model size and right uh for, for the right data set right they usually think about number of parameters and number of samples, but they don't really think about context length as well and how that affects what model size to choose. Um, that is certainly its own dimension that it could be fairly complex and I'm, I'm pretty sure people have not come up with scaling laws or rules about how to select those, which I think is going to be, and we are also interested in that, um, that scaling behavior Especially, or you. training behavior in, in, in future work. You're welcome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, we got a question from Ruben. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Thanks for the great talk. I had a question about um, if you looked at the embeddings of your model com and compared those to protein language model embeddings, or in general, if you looked at the parallel with um, language models trained on protein sequences. Yeah. Good question. We we had we did not. Um, we. I imagine we're looking at very different things. <laughs> For example, uh, sorry, the language mo the, those protein models are trained on amino acids uh, sequences, yeah. uh, so just coding regions and, and no regulatory regions. Where our our model is pretty much mostly regulatory regions, right? Like ninety eight percent, presumably. Um, and so, yeah, that would be very interesting to see <laughs> what the differences are in terms of the embeddings. Um, that, that yeah, I, I mean, I guess. If I can go back up here, we, you know, we, we do, so we do have um, some coding region sequences that we isolate 
uh, and look at their embeddings and compare that to um, other types of transcripts. So there's there's that, but we did not compare it to protein language models. So that's that's a very interesting question. Cool. Um, I think I don't see more questions. Uh, if, yeah, is it, if there's anybody else has a question, feel free to chime in. And if not, um, yeah, that then that's was really fun, guys. <laughs> Great questions. Um, I would have oh. uh, one question because that you mentioned this um, text conditioning, and um, I'm asking that because we try something similar for molecules, where we try to tie together molecule structure with a lot of text. And I'm not sure if this for DNA, I guess the data set would be not there, or it's more or less tricky to get. But I guess, he, and this is my question, like, he, if you could mix, in the end, you could mix with, with the model setup you, you showed us today, um, text with DNA, and even maybe increase context length even more, if it makes sense. So I'm thinking also in the direction you have a paper about a gene, you could actually feed the abstract in with the gene sequence, or, or maybe even more than just the abstract, and maybe then the text information carries over in, in kind of the other modality, and hopefully it makes sense for the model, and then it can predict better on, on other tasks that are somehow related. I'm not sure if this if you think this is feasible or if this is kind of too still too much right in, in terms of context length yeah that, that's super interesting so i imagine to do that task the way you, you described it you would need a pretty massive model just trained on natural language broadly and i think there's previous models that kind of are, are more along that line where i think it's is it bio gpt or gene gpt i think gene gpt is the one mm -hmm. um where they mostly train on natural language and then also incorporate some the genomic sequences. And so it's kind of like the re like reverse ratio where it's like mostly natural language with some um, genomic information and some annotations. I think, I suspect that kind of model would work better at, versus mm -hmm. where you, if, you, if you train a model folk, you know, solely on genomic sequences and add some language, I, I imagine that would, have, would struggle because um, you know, you're asking your model to do a lot more Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean i think i think in general that would be super interesting mm -hmm. awesome awesome any questions i guess all people are ah, i guess one more oh no stephen yeah didn't saw that hey, hey. Uh, great presentation, awesome work. Uh, just a quick question about um, parameter and uh, training data size. Is it, I might have missed this, if there's just huge trade-offs based on the architecture that you used, but uh, would it not be possible to just train Hyena also on larger parameter sizes and more data and just expect better results? Or were you saying, and I maybe missed this, that there's just an inherent trade-off based on the fact that you designed the architecture differently? No, great question. So. I 100% believe that a larger model would do better. <laughs> um, so I suppose the const key constraint here is um, we had a certain compute budget, and this was the this was the you know trying to do as much as we could with with the given compute budget. Um, and so I suppose a couple of good things about that, right? So one is it's it's a good signal for future work, but two, it it sort of forces you to be maybe more creative with constraints. <laughs> Um, but yeah, fortunately, this work has opened up more compute for us. And so we are absolutely interested in larger scale versions uh, of this model or similar uh, in the biology space. Nice. Yeah, I'm excited to see that because obviously, you know, you already blew nucleotide transformer a little bit out of the water with like much smaller parameter sizes and less data. And now it's just, hey, crank it up and you'll probably get, you know, 10x improvement. So I'm excited to see that. Oh, yeah. It's so great to be excited. But to caveat there is that uh, it depends on the tasks. So, so on these benchmarks, those like the, the nucleotide transformer, um, a bigger model did not help there for us because we suspect the data sets are small and the sequence lengths are pretty small. But um, so, so when we say we want to work on bigger models, we also want to expand the scope at which we attack these problems too. Um, look for larger data sets, tasks that actually you know require even longer context lengths potentially. Um, and so we, 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 we're kind of moving the target a little bit as well with these larger models. 
Understood. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Thank. Great question. Cool. I I guess we were one hundred percent clear, and everybody was satisfied with all the answers. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, guys, uh, very excited to, um, to to hear from folks uh, if they actually apply it and see that it you know it works in the real world or quote unquote real world for them, um, because ultimately we want to move this from you know a purely academic exercise to see if we can help people uh, with their their actual tasks they care about. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, James. Uh, really appreciate the uh, great discussion. And, and yeah, thanks again, Michael, for inviting. This has been this has been super fun. Um, I'm really glad to meet folks and engage with the community more. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm admittedly newer to this space, and so um, people ask great questions, better ones than I could think of. So very excited. Yeah. Also, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I, I like the explanations a lot at the beginning about the Hena operator. I guess that that um, made it more kind of uh, easier to grasp. And also, yeah, great talk, very smooth. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'm glad. Um, yeah, I, I'm much more a visual person, so I tend to steer away from the mathematics part details and just like try to <laughs> walk through diagrams. So hopefully that mm -hmm. you know, found that useful. All right. I guess people are happy with the questions so far. Um, yeah, then we can leave it there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, have a great evening over there in the UK. Is that right? I'm based in Central Europe. Yeah. So just one hour. Different. Europe. Yeah. Okay. Um, awesome. Awesome. But, yeah. Have a good evening then. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. It was a nice day. I will also send you the recording once it's finished processing. And okay. yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. And I guess people also, because we had a very high attendance and, and a lot of questions. I guess it was in the oh. top top three Channel Club presentations from my friend. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I'm very glad. I'm very glad. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.